Arizona Wildlife Views. We'll head to northeastern Arizona and check out a very different kind of rodeo where the cowboys aren't necessarily cowboys at all. Then we'll head south into the Santa Rita Mountains where bird watchers are in search of the most elegant of creatures. But first, just as the monsoon rains bring welcome relief from the summer heat, they also bring in some very unique visitors who are only here for a few short weeks. All of this and more begins right now on Arizona Wildlife Views. For much of the year, the Sonoran Desert's vast plains and mountains lie parched and inhospitable beneath steel blue and cloudless skies. The dry and cracked earth looks in some places as though it has never felt the sweet kiss of a raindrop. Rivers of sand tell the story of what once was, and in the blistering heat of summer, seems like will never be again. When the unbelievable heat has reached its peak, when all creation seems to be holding its breath, salvation comes. The winds shift, there is something different in the air. July's rain-heavy clouds migrate northward from the tropics and bring the promise of rain for the first time in months. The summer rainy season has finally arrived. The saguaro stands tall, its arms raised as if giving homage to the oncoming rains. Drop by drop, the rain places a gentle peck on the cheek of the thirsty, prickly pear. These gentle kisses become rivulets, flowing into washes that soon overflow their boundaries and flood the desert. These raging torrents are sometimes beautiful, sometimes disastrous, but always needed. Remarkably, for a few brief weeks, water is abundant. Life stirs. Plants that have stood gray and leafless, evading the relentless aridity, sprout leaves almost overnight. Animals, too, seemingly giddy by ready access to the rarest of commodities, sate their thirst and gorge themselves on the abundance that rain brings. Millipedes, euphemistically called rainworms, trundle across the terrain in search of a meal. Rattlesnakes, like this Mojave rattlesnake, take up ambush positions near ponds, awaiting birds and rodents that are attracted to the water. As the rains cover the usually dry desert, another amazing event takes place. From seemingly out of nowhere, desert amphibians begin their annual breeding period. In a few places in Arizona, as many as seven species of desert amphibians inhabit a single mud puddle. During the arid summer, these amphibians shelter up to several feet below the desert's parched surface. The sound of rain awakens an army of thousands which claw their way into the night to greet the storm and come into the world of stars, wind, rain, and lightning for the first time in more than nine months. Soon, their urgent call fills the night air. What starts out as turbid, lifeless puddles are soon teeming with all manner of life. These water holes are nurseries, ushering the next generation of desert amphibians into a harsh world. One of the first to return to the pond is the spadefoot. Four species of spadefoots are found in Arizona, but it's the couches spadefoot that inhabits the harshest of Arizona's desert lands. All are medium-sized for Arizona amphibians, ranging between two and three and a half inches. Spadefoots get their name from a dark spade-like turbicle on the underside of their back feet that is used for burrowing. Other distinctive characteristics are their relatively smooth, moist skin, absence of large poison glands, and vertical pupils. Couch's spadefoot is in many ways the most highly adapted of the West Desert amphibians. Should the rains not materialize, they have the ability to wait two years or more until conditions are proper for activity. Because water in the desert is such a fleeting resource, there is great urgency to procreate. Aroused from their dormancy by the sounds of rain, they often arrive at breeding pools as they are filling with water. Male spadefoots and other desert amphibians are the first to arrive at the breeding pools. They establish calling sites and begin their serenade. Females arrive later, attracted by the sweet songs of the males. Eggs are laid that night and hatch in less than 24 hours. Being early presents numerous advantages for spadefoots. 
Often, early in the season, they are the only species calling from a pool and plaintive bleats carry through the humid summer's night air without competition from other species. From a distance, their calls sound like a flock of sheep calling in the night. Their tadpoles also have opportunity at limited food resources and develop in an environment relatively free of predators. While in the tadpole stage of development, the struggle for food and space is fierce. Some tadpoles become cannibalistic and consume their siblings and other puddle mates, while others may secrete a growth inhibitor that will stunt their peers, giving themselves an advantage and better access to food and space. The tadpoles quickly develop into toadlets and leave the pools in as few as seven days. In fact, spadefoot tadpoles develop so quickly that they often leave the pool before predators or other amphibian species arrive in numbers. After breeding, spadefoots linger on the surface, feeding and perhaps breeding a time or two more with subsequent storms. They have only a few weeks to get on with the business of life before the desert again returns to its typically arid state and they must retreat underground until next year. The name Colorado River Toad is a bit misleading as this species is widely distributed in the Sonoran and parts of the Chihuahuan Desert. It is the largest of Arizona's toads, exceeding a pound and a half in weight and seven inches in length without its legs extended. Heavy and robust, a large Colorado River Toad is an impressive animal. Their prodigious girth is matched only by their appetite. Like most toads, they are eating machines, consuming nearly anything they can fit into their mouths and choke down. Colorado River Toads are very long-lived and have been documented reaching ages of over 25 years. Considering that they rely on standing water for breeding in one of the most arid habitats in North America, this longevity is a tremendous advantage. Most amphibians, lacking both tooth and claw, are relatively helpless creatures and rely on agility and speed to avoid would-be predators. Unfortunately for most toads, they are as short on those two commodities as they are on good looks. Such a large and seemingly helpless morsel should be an easy mark for a predator, but not so. Located behind their eyes and on their hind limbs are large, wart-like poison glands called paratoid glands. These glands produce a powerful neurotoxin called bufatine, which is capable of paralyzing and even killing an animal much larger than itself. When the toad is molested, the glands ooze a white viscous fluid that once ingested can prove fatal to an attacker. So toads, and the Colorado River toad in particular, are free to go about their business relatively free of the attentions of predators. Surprisingly, their quiet mating calls seems a mismatch for such a large toad. Their call, a soft, throaty trill, is often completely drowned out by the other amphibian species that are calling from the same pool. The red-spotted toad is one of the most widely distributed amphibians in Arizona. It ranges from oak and pine woodlands into some of our most arid desert habitats. Often associated with rocky canyons, it is not uncommon in desert flats and upland habitats. This is one of the smaller species of toads, typically less than three inches in length. Often, its dorsum is covered with small, rust-colored warts, giving rise to its name, the red-spotted toad. Large adults are often uniformly gray or brown in color, without any spotting at all. Red-spotted toads, unlike most other desert amphibians, breed in both the spring and the summer. If the winter rains have been generous, it is not uncommon to hear their melodious, high-pitched mating trills coming from pools nestled in rocky canyons. The vividly colored Sonoran Green Toad is a close relative of the Red Spotted Toad. At two inches in length, it is second only to the Narrow Mouth Toad in its diminutive size among Sonoran Desert Amphibians. Their green, warty skin, adorned with black reticulations and large paratoid glands, help distinguish the species from other Sonoran desert amphibians. Sonoran green toads are one of the few amphibian species whose distribution is wholly confined to the Sonoran desert. They extend as far north as southern Maricopa County in Arizona. These toads eat relatively small prey, focusing their diet on ants, small beetles, and termites. 
Sonoran green toads typically give their buzzer-like call from the edge of the water. The inflated vocal sac acts as a megaphone amplifying the call of the toad. A satellite male has taken up a position near a calling male. Satellite males are toads that don't call, but rather seek to exploit the efforts of another, more vocal male. They skulk near the calling male in hopes to intercept and steal away any female that may respond to the efforts of the calling male. Female toads select their mates on a variety of criteria, all of which are not fully understood by biologists. What is known is that the vocalizations of calling male toads are a representation of genetic fitness, and females make their selection based on his performance. Great Plains toad are one of the most commonly encountered desert breeding amphibians. They have rough, warty skin with large pear blotches on their backs, giving them a camouflaged appearance. Their large bean-shaped vocal pouch magnifies their calls to impressive levels. In fact, the calls of the Great Plains toad is one of the loudest of any desert amphibian, often heard for as much as four miles distance. When experienced from close proximity, their call can actually be painful to the ear. Since both sexes in most amphibians look alike, one may wonder how they tell each other apart. The answer is, they don't, at least not based on appearance. Once male toads take up a location to call from, they pounce on any toad that ventures near in hopes of finding a mate. This leads to some interesting, and one would think embarrassing, interactions among would-be suitors. Fortunately, toads seem oblivious to anything akin to embarrassment. When a male toad is grabbed by another amorous male, it gives a short series of chirps known as a release call, which informs the aggressor of his mistake, whereupon he quickly releases the molested toad. The lowland burrowing tree frog is a tropical species that reaches its northern distributional limits in southern Arizona. This is a moderate-sized frog of about two and a half inches in length. Its relatively smooth, moist skin is covered with large giraffe-like spots on its back, and its mouth is slightly compressed and duckbill-like. This distinctive amphibian has a heavily reinforced thick skull with which it may plug its burrow when inactive. It burrows far beneath the desert's arid surface while estivating during dry months. During these times, it sloths its skin, forming a cocoon or bag of sorts to protect it from desiccation. A bilobed vocal sac magnifies its mating vocalizations, a series of quack-like calls. A close look at their enlarged toe tips reveals that they are very closely related to the more widespread climbing tree frogs found elsewhere in Arizona and the New World. Though adult burrowing tree frogs spend the majority of their lives on or beneath the ground, they occasionally call from perches up to several feet above the ground, and the young are known to climb low vegetation. In the United States, this species is largely restricted to mesquite grassland communities in south-central Arizona. Ranging from oak woodlands to desert flats in south-central Arizona, the Great Plains narrowmouth toad is a seldom-seen member of Arizona's amphibian fraternity. A small pointed head attached to a bulbous body with smooth, moist skin and minute size distinguish this toad from all other desert amphibians. At a little over an inch and a half in length, this is the smallest of Arizona's desert amphibians. It is dwarfed by most of the species it shares breeding sites with in the Sonoran Desert. Narrow-mouthed toads are shy and secretive and typically call from sheltered sites, making them difficult to observe. The call resembles that of an insect more than it does of that of a toad. Narrow-mouthed toads prey chiefly on ants, termites, and other very small insects. Interestingly, they have been observed sharing the burrows of tarantulas. Apparently, they enjoy protection and shelter provided by the giant spiders without any negative consequences from their hairy roommates. As summer gives way to fall, the time of rain ends and the desert again dons its dusty mantle. The young amphibians that were born in the now drying pools and survived the onslaught of predators and desiccation now follow their elders, burrowing deep into the desert soil to lie dormant until the rains return. Next year, when the rains return, the toads will again leave the underworld for Earth's starlit surface, just as they have for thousands of years.
If you want to do crazy things on your ATV, the Arizona Outlaw Rodeo and Eager is the place to be. Well, a lot of the, the rodeo is uh, a way of, of showing support for their, their sport, their activity, um, hobby that they like to engage in. They do things that normally wouldn't be appropriate on the trail. Um, and they do it in this controlled environment where if there uh, was any problems, they'd be able to get to medical treatment quickly. But also it keeps it from being out in the, in the wild and, and impacting habitat and causing degradation. But then still they get to, to do things that uh, they consider to be a lot of fun. The rodeo is only one part of the annual Arizona ATV Outlaw Trail Jamboree. The five-day happening includes a parade, trading post, and the main event, lots of off-highway trail riding. This is our first year with the Jamboree, and I heard about it after last year's Jamboree and talked to some people that went on it, and all they had was raves, reviews. So I lucked, I lucked out and had my wife let me come up here and I've spent five glorious days and had some beautiful, beautiful rides. Some of the best riding I've ever done in over 22 years of ATV riding. Jamboree is, uh, is an opportunity for ATV enthusiasts to get together and they go out and they ride trails um, with an emphasis on, on safety and etiquette. Um, so they really try to, to get people to understand that responsible riding is not only something that they need to learn about, but it's also something that they need to practice when they're out in the field. Off-highway vehicle riding has become one of the fastest growing recreation activities around. Since 1998, the sales and registrations of ATVs has risen nearly 350 percent in Arizona. One of the reasons for the boom here is that there is so much public land available with a wide variety of terrain for people to ride on. But in order to be a safe rider, there are some things to consider. Riding an ATV isn't just sitting on an ATV and cruising through the, the woods or on a trail. Uh, riding an ATV is, is what they call rider active. People have to be mobile on the seat, and that's why the seat is so long, so that you can move and adjust your weight um, to how the, the machine is going to, to behave um, over a given substrate or during a, a certain maneuver. They highly recommend that all wear uh, helmets, of course, in Arizona. Anybody that's under the age of 18 has to wear a protective helmet while they're operating or if they're a passenger on board. Wear long sleeve shirts, uh, to wear gloves. You have to have goggles. Um, as per state law, the uh, operator has to wear goggles or glasses, some kind of eye protection, or have a windshield on the front of the, of the motorcycle or ATV that they're operating. And uh, to also wear long pants when they're out operating, and to wear boots that would go over the ankle to help mitigate the injuries if they were to occur. Unfortunately, accidents do occur. The Consumer Safety Products Association did a study that showed there were over 2,500 deaths attributed to ATVs between 2000 and 2004. Well, the first thing is I would, would ask them to look at the, the machines and make sure that they're size appropriate um, for their age. That's one of the big things, and that they're size appropriate for their, their body. Um, because a lot of times people will get machines that are quite a bit larger, more power than they absolutely need, and, and it can be a lot tougher to handle. Riding off-road can also have a negative impact on the environment. That's why staying on established trails is so important for both the habitat and the wildlife that relies on that habitat. We try to instill the message into people that uh, wildlife and uh, ATVs, they, they need to have their space, of course. And uh, there's been some mitigation efforts that the department has done um, to where they uh, have worked with land management agencies to make um, areas a noise reduction zone. Uh, to help protect, uh, protect wildlife uh, habitat and wildlife species during critical times of the year, of course. You have to, because if you don't, somebody can get hurt, somebody can get lost. Uh, the trail riding that we do is, they say, intermediate to, to moderate, but a lot of it was some advanced riding, too. And the dangers out there, uh, if you miss a, a hill or miss a tree or something, you can break a limb, fall off, hurt yourself. But everybody out here knew the rules, knew to, to follow the person in front of them, keep an eye out on the person behind them so they don't get spread out and get lost. And everybody was safety conscious. We rode over 36,000 miles this year on this jamboree without an accident. That's where events like the ATV rodeo come in. Everyone can have a good time, test their skills, get a little crazy, and everyone goes home safe and happy.
they sound similar to a hen turkey. Um, it's kind of a yuck, 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 and they do it in four or eight, a series of four or eight, and that's the sound that you listen for. Not a very elegant sound for a bird called the elegant trogon. This colorful South American bird heads north in the summer to nest while it is winter time in its native land. Tom Wetton, an information and education program manager with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, is an avid trogon watcher. Only about 200 trogons come to the United States every year. And of that, they only come to southeastern Arizona. And it is easy to see why they are such a favorite of people who are lucky enough to see one in the wild. Now this bird, because it's a tropical bird, it is multicolored. It really is. Now it has a bright yellow beak. It has a uh, blackish head with orange rings around its eyes. The back of the head, down the back, is almost a phosphorescent green at times, depending on the sunlight hits it. The breast on the male is red with a white stripe across it. The tail has a coppery look to it on the outside, and on the inside it has lattice work, uh, light bars of, of black on a uh, off-white tail. So what we have is a seven or eight colored bird that is spectacular to view and hard to find. Southern Arizona is the northernmost edge of the elegant Trogun's range. So, Madera Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains and the area around Portal in the Chiricahua Mountains are the best places to see them in the United States. And they are a bird watcher's favorite. You know, people come uh, from all over the world to see elegant Trogons in southeastern Arizona. If you want to see them in the United States, this is where you have to come. The elegant Trogon is a specialty species for people who are uh, listing birds who keep a life list of birds and most bird watchers will keep a list of the birds that they have seen but generally people who have not birded in southern Arizona will add a hundred birds to their life list because there's that many species the number of birds different species here that you cannot get in other places troguns are easy to hear in the canyon but harder to spot they are most active in the early morning the easiest way to see an elegant trogon is to locate a tree cavity where they are nesting. They arrive in mid-April and are gone by October. The pairs mate for the season and will shop for just the right place. The male shows the female several available tree cavities before she picks the final site. These particular birds moved, moved in here into this nest cavity on Mother's Day. Luis Calvo is the owner of the Chuparosa Inn in Madera Canyon. He is lucky enough to have a pair of elegant troguns nesting in the creek bed behind his inn. That gave us ample opportunity to observe the birds coming and going from the nest, bringing bugs in to feed the chicks. Bird watching is big business for Luis and all of Arizona. Watchful wildlife, that is birders if you will, are responsible economically for $1.5 billion in the state's economy. That's big business. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that amount. That We have people that come here from all over the world, certainly from all over the United States, uh, that come to Madera Canyon uh, to bird at least once in their lifetime. They're spending uh, money on food and lodging and rental cars and birding guides and books, just about anything you can think of that you would need while you're on vacation. Now the elegant trogun is only about 12 inches long, but with its bright colors and distinct markings, it is considered one of the most beautiful birds in all of North America. It is, it's one of those birds that you just don't ever forget. And for bird watchers, um, there may be rarer birds that you can, that you can find and, and see. But uh, as far as being one that is as elegant, there isn't one, in my opinion. <laughs>